Hi, I'm Paul Alavisados. I'm director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I'm, uh, I've been a researcher in the field of the chemistry of nanomaterials for about 25 years. And uh, I very much enjoy the study of nanocrystals and their physical and chemical properties. And um, some years ago, I got involved in uh, trying to propose the creation of some nanoscience research centers, including the Molecular Foundry here at the Berkeley Lab. And as I worked in that area over time, I got more excited about the work that the laboratory did. So I ultimately became material science division director here. And when Steve Chu came to be the lab director, I um, became his deputy director. <laughs> when Steve left to became secretary of energy, <laughs> I ended up becoming the director. It's a really fun job. This laboratory was really um, started through very, very fundamental science discoveries and remains a place where really um, wonderful basic discoveries are being made. Uh, as you came through here, you passed by a corridor with the, uh, you know, 13 Nobel Prizes in the history, the most recent one, Saul Perlmutter, discovery of dark energy. Uh, that's a very fundamental discovery today. We don't know how to use that for anything. But I think anyone who learns about the fact that the universe is um, not only expanding, but accelerating in its expansion, I mean, that's a very amazing thing to wrap your head around and try to learn about. So we're very proud of the basic science that we do. But a national lab like this one, the country creates it with the idea in mind that it will also in the, um, be a piece of the innovation ecosystem and will help foster prosperity in the country. <laughs> and I think the national lab system as a whole was created in an era where the focus was perhaps more on security related issues. Today it would be more I mean, there are still many security issues. We don't here at Berkeley Lab do any classified work. But, but we do have an intense focus on how we can help uh, be a, an important part of the innovation system. And there's a lot of discoveries that um, have been made here uh, that have impacted the practical aspects of the world. Uh, things like um, low emiss emissivity windows and uh, things like um, discoveries that have impacted how we use energy in a, in, a, in a whole range of ways. But today the lab is also organizing itself more and more to be able to help in those areas. And the one thing I hope is that we'll also maintain a really strong basic component because um, it, the, that pipeline of new uh, technologies won't appear automatically unless we also have the fundamental science. And sometimes we can be in danger a little bit of losing track of that. The nanomaterials that I've been involved in have found some commercial applications. The earliest ones we were involved in was in biological imaging. Uh, at uh, Quantum Dot Corporation some years ago, we developed the use of uh, quantum dots for luminescent labeling of biological tissues. and. Those materials are available today for commercial use. Um, but also, they, um, these light emitting materials can be used in displays. And um, I've got one right here. This is a quantum dot emissive film made at a company called uh, Nanosys using the technology that we've developed. It has green and red emitting quantum dots inside it. And this uh, tablet here is a Kindle Fire HDX. It's got um, the green and red uh, colors in it are excited in this film that uh, is inside this display with blue light exciting from the sides and then the green and red colors come from that. And what's fun about it is the colors are really very high quality because the quantum dots have much narrower emission than typical emitters so you get higher color purity and turns out also longer battery life. So. That's an application that's emerging, and I think we'll see quantum dot displays in a lot of different technologies in the coming years. We are working on solar applications uh, of quantum dots, um, and uh, we're trying to develop some new ideas in that area, but nothing quite yet ready for you know, real commercial use, but it's a researchy area that's a lot of fun right now. If we look at nanoscience more broadly, 
there's much broader range of applications that have to do with new types of drug delivery agents and things of that type where uh, there's a lot of formulation and capability of introducing drugs in ways that look like they will be uh, successful over time. So that's another aspect of nanoscience and, and medicine. The question about the brain is a really interesting one. Um, we don't yet have um, all the ways that we would like for sensing um, electric fields and um, chemical changes, changes of ion concentration or, or transmitter species in the brain that, that, that we would really ideally like to have. And I think nanoscience will play an important role in developing those kinds of sensors. And there's a lot of work to make new types of um, probes, whether they're physical or optical probes, for neural activity. The president has announced a new brain initiative which has as a goal to find ways to measure the activity of large numbers of neurons simultaneously. And I think nanoscience will be at the core of that. With any new area of science and any new technology, there are also risks. And um, it's really important for us to recognize that as part of the inception, even, of a field. And in the nanoscience case, when the nanotechnology initiative first started, that was recognized and, and support early on came for developing understanding of the risks and issues of societal concern about nanotechnology. I do want to say up front, uh, just the other day I was giving a talk in public about this and, and people said, okay, what about, you know, we could be concerned about um, whether nanomaterials can self-organize and sort of the, you know, gray goo uh, fear that is out there and I think um, while we've gotten more and more sophisticated in our ability to make nanomaterials uh, we're nowhere close to being able to make materials that can do the kinds of things that have been in those sort of um, fictional novels and so on. So that I think is less of a concern but there are concerns around um, you know we, we talked a moment ago about how nanomaterials can be used for imaging that means that they can be introduced inside a biological system and so they can also potentially be uh, toxic in some circumstances. And there's a nascent field of nanotoxicology trying to understand what happens there. And that field is developing. It, it had a slow start at the beginning because of the fact that you can take a nanoscale building block of a certain composition and formulate it differently. You can coat it with different organic layers that will change how it enters the human body completely. Uh, it, this exact same material can be um, immediately ejected from the body or uh, reside there for a very long time, just the exact same composition material formulated differently. And I think uh, in the early stages of trying to develop nanotoxicology, we've had to struggle with that because our traditional way of classifying toxicity just says, okay, it's this material. It is or it isn't toxic. But in fact, it's not that simple here. It's more complex. And I think the community is making great strides right now in establishing standards for how to evaluate formulations and then make a, you know, a, a deeper understanding of what really is or is not of concern. And I think that's a terribly important thing. We're a little bit slow at doing it. I think it would be great if we could go even a little bit faster so that the early materials that are finding commercial application don't inadvertently have a situation where we cause harm to people. We're emerging from what had been a, kind of a difficult period for science funding broadly in the United States. Um, investments, federal investments overall, um, have not kept pace. And um, so there's a lot of dislocation in science, broadly speaking. Um, at universities, at national labs, and um, you know, throughout basically the science discovery centers in the United States. And I, I think we have a very resilient system, but nonetheless, it's been a tough period. We've certainly felt it here. Uh, we have found ways in the last few years to really increase the efficiency of our operations a lot. Three decades ago, uh, the U.S. was really kind of um, 
unchallenged as the scientific leader of the world. Uh, today, it's a much more complicated picture. Uh, and I think in some ways it's very positive to see so many other countries um, making really tremendous investments in science and developing the people and the culture so that uh, the United States isn't in the same position that it was earlier. So having this kind of period of a few years where we almost take a pause <laughs> in our science funding uh, really impacts us quite dramatically in a competitive sense. And so I'm concerned about that very deeply. We've certainly had effects here. We've had to change our plans. Um, and we're trying to um, develop plans that are going to be uh, achievable but still put us in a strong position to remain competitive. That's something we're working hard on.